church. Well, my name is Will Hampton. I'm the lead pastor here. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I would love to do that. In fact, at the end of the service today, there's a little welcome center back here. My wife and I will be there, and we'd love to get a chance to say hello, shake your hand, and there's some gifts that we have for you um, right back there in the welcome center area. And then y'all just saw a little promo for groups. Pastor Andrew is going to be out there in the lobby, and his wife, me, will be there, and they're going to help you get connected and plugged into a group. And if you don't get a chance to see him there, you can always go to www.tworivers.church slash groups. And there's about 30 groups that you can look down through and pick one out, find one at a time and a place that works for you. And then if you don't see a group that works for you, go ahead and start one and we'll get, a, we'll get another group up and going. And I think that groups are, are probably one of the most important things that can happen in a church. Uh, I, I believe that our community in, in our world is really desperate for connection. Like I, I find myself during the day, I pull my phone out and I want to like kind of scroll down through social media. Does anybody do that where you're like, hey, let me just see what's happening. What I discover is going on in my heart is that I actually just, I'm hoping to connect. I'm hoping to have some kind of connection that takes place as I'm, I'm rolling down through that. And, and I believe that we're all wired for connection. We're all wired for community. And one of the best ways for that to happen is when you get into a small group. So we're getting a piece of that. Like, I've never been really that satisfied scrolling down through Facebook or Instagram. It's been like, oh, and then you just keep on going forever. And you, you don't get that sense of satisfaction. But I get that when I go to groups. I get that when my wife and I, we host a group and, and we have people come in and we get to talk about our stuff. Because when you're on like social media, you get the fake version of somebody, right? And in fact, you can come here to this room and get the fake version of everybody. How you know, oh, I'm doing great. Oh, there's nothing wrong with me. Everything's fine. And because no one's, you know, you don't feel safe enough. You don't feel like there's any trust. In, in a room full of people to be able to reveal who you are. But when you get into that smaller group, you can get with people and you can begin to develop some trust and then you can kind of reveal yourself. And in that, that's when we begin to really grow. That's when God shows up and does some work. And so I'm a huge believer in, in getting involved in a group and being plugged in and having that community, having that connection. And so there's a couple ways to do that. Just go see at the groups TV out in the lobby or sign up online. And then, and then on the 29th, we're launching those groups up. And, and so there's some groups that are actually getting going now. And we do groups for about eight weeks and then four weeks off. So if you get in a group you don't like, just, there's another cycle coming. <laughs> I don't like these people. I don't want to get to know them. All right, go get in another group. And, and so, so you're going to find a group that works for you, and there's a whole bunch of different things, but we, there, that is where you're going to connect, and that's where you're going to grow, and I believe that that's God's purpose in your life for you to get connected in the groups. And then the, the second thing I want to point out is that tonight at 5 o'clock, my wife invited you out for next. We, tonight's next session is the session we're going to help you discover your purpose. God made you with a design. He didn't make you by accident. I was at a, at a hospital this week. A, a man had uh, tried to commit suicide. He came to the end of his, his hope in this life, and, and there was a lot of pain, a lot of things that he's dealing with, but uh, just felt like there was no purpose left. And you need to know and what I told him was the reason that he's still here, he had taken so much, there's no way that he should still be here. He just, he had significantly, strategically, well planned out, tried to commit suicide and, and somehow it's a miracle that he's still alive. And I said, the reason for that is that God is not done with you. There is a purpose for your life, that there is a destiny that you need to fulfill and that's what everyone needs to hear and understand is that God is not done with you, that there is a purpose for your life, there is a destiny that you need to fulfill, and I want you to discover that as you go into the Next Steps class tonight, and 
You're going to reveal, God, you're going to discover your design, and that's going to give you a picture into what you ought to be doing and how you ought to be doing it. And I like to say it like this. We can't be who God's called us to be until you're doing what God designed you to do. And, and there's just only so, like as churches get bigger, people think, oh, we don't need to go to work. We don't need to do anything. And that's the reverse. As the church gets bigger, we need more people to get working and more people to get activated so that we can reach more people and we can celebrate, transform lives as people give their lives to Jesus. So I'll see all of you tonight at five o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I want to talk today about walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. And I want to greet everybody that's joining us online. You, you're tuning in on Facebook Live. We're so glad to be able to, to connect with you. I know there's a bunch of you that are out and about and you weren't able to make it in this week. And I get messages all the time thanking us for having that Facebook feed up and the live church. And then some of y'all are joining us on YouTube. And I just go, church, could we just give a great big round of applause? Let them know that we love them. And that we're so glad that, you know, we miss them. And if you get a chance to join us here live, we, we know you're going to have a, a better time with us. And in fact, that's part of why we're trying to do locations. There's some people that join us online all the time that uh, they can't quite get here. It's an hour and a half to two hours for them to get to church. And they're waiting for the Cortland location to get going. So they're joining us online. And, and so when we get Cortland up and going, then, then we'll have one out in Cor Corning. And then we're exploring the Canadagua location. And so God's kind of increasing our footprint in our territory. And, and so we're super glad that you're able to tune in with us. Um, I'm going to share my dream with you a little bit. I just want to talk just for a couple moments about what I believe God's doing. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of this dreamer. I have these, these big dreams. And as I dream, I, I'm like, these are things that I can't do. It's beyond me. It's, it's way beyond what, what I'm capable of. And, but I believe that God is able and so there's some things that, that we said before we started the church. There was nothing. We were meeting. I remember we were supposed to meet in the Shenango Town Hall for our very first meeting. And I was going to get the key, and I saw that the town hall offices were closed. And I was like, how am I going to get the... I, I told... as our very first launch team meeting. This is a big deal, and I don't have the key to let us in. So we scrambled, and we, we ended up going to... Grande's Pizzeria and had our first meeting in Grande's. And I'm thinking to myself, Lord, how am I going to lead a church? My family's in a camper and, and I didn't get the key. Like this is the very first thing that happened to start the church. I was so discouraged. Like, I can't believe I don't have a key to get us into the place that I told everybody where we're going to meet. I said, God, this isn't going to go so good. Like, I don't know if I'm the right guy. And at that meeting, at that first meeting, I was telling people, we're going to grow a church and we're going to launch large and people are going to come to know Jesus by the thousands and all these things are going to happen. And I felt like such a fraud. You ever say something, you're like, I'm a total fraud. I don't know how that's going to happen. And, and that's what was happening in my life. I was like, God, I don't know how this is going to happen. I, don't, I, don't, I, I believe that he told us to go and I believe that he said to do it. But inside somewhere, I was, I was like, I don't have the goods. And, and I just remember God always just encouraging me. I'd go to read the Bible, and I'd read about David and Goliath. And I'd see some little punk kid talking smack because that's what he knows. He knows his God. And so this guy was talking smack about our God. And he was like, I'll show you. Today, the crows are going to eat your body, and I'm going to hold your head up. I'm going to cut your head off with your own sword. And, and so, so I read that stuff and I'll get all stoked up. And I was like, if David can do it, then I can do it. And I'd encourage myself in the Lord. And, and you know what it comes down to? It comes down to that, that God has a plan and a dream for your life that is bigger than you. It's bigger than me. And, and so I'm just going to share a couple of dreams because I don't believe that you're here today by accident. 
I believe that it, in order for us, to, like I believe that, that there's a dream that we can get to together. And that your purpose and your destiny and how God has designed you, there's some vital role that you will play in us being able to accomplish that dream. So I want to, as your pastor, just take a couple of moments and tell you the crazy things I've signed you up for. So here's, here's what I'm believing God for. I'm believing God for, for uh, 10 locations of Two Rivers Church. So that sounds almost too small now that we're about to be four locations. And with that, 100,000 souls. That's the, that's the big thing. We've seen 1,500 people in five years have come to Jesus. 1,500 people in five years. And, and I believe that that was like 1,000 people. I remember a couple years back we said, we're going to see 1,000 people come to know Christ. And I was like, oh, that sounds crazy. And, and then we ran right past that. And... What I'm believing God now is for is 100,000 people to give their lives to Christ. 10 locations, and then I'm believing God for 100 church plants all around the Northeast. We're gonna plant, help start new churches because new churches are the best way to reach new people. And then I'm believing God for a premier children's ministry, an outreach ministry where we have a, I, I, I got like crazy plans for this, but I want to have ice cream trucks that go around with little tickets that are free tickets for ice cream. And you give them to the kids as they come out. And then you say, Hey, you got to come back to this park in an hour, make sure your mom signed off. And then when they get to the park, we'll have a, a truck and the side of the truck will come down and it'll turn into a stage. The music will be up and, and all these kids are just going to come right off the streets and come into the parks and we're going to throw a party for these kids and then we're going to tell them about Jesus and we're going to tell them that Jesus loves them, he's never forgotten them, he's always pursuing them and we're just going to reach thousands and thousands of kids like the Pied Piper, the kids just following the music and so I got a dream that there'll be 2,000 kids that are in the foster care system that are in Christian homes. That there, there will be all, all the kids in, in Broome County would find a house that's safe. There's a Christian family that's making sure to take good care of them and that the orphans in our community be cared for and loved. And that's gonna be messy, it's gonna be dirty, it's gonna be tough, but you know something? That's what this thing is all about. I got a dream that people will be picking people up to bring them to church. Not just the van. The van's kind of cool, but how much better is it when I show up at your door and I pick you up every single week and you build a relationship together and there's somebody that knows you and there's somebody that's concerned for you and said, hey, where were you? Hey, what's going on in your life? Hey, what's happening there? And my dream, I'm, Stacy, I'm going to tell on you for a second. It's okay. I love Stacy's story. We're going to share these stories in a little bit. I'm talking to the media team about developing some of these stories. But Stacy was telling me she cuts my hair. Good job, Stacy. <laughs> and we were talking about how did Stacy come to Jesus? And she said when she was little, I'm gonna cry. I'm sorry, Stacy. I love it. But when she was young, she came to church and found Jesus. Her whole family life was a wreck. Nobody in her family was going to church. But somebody from that church said, I'm going to come and get you. And they came every week and picked up Stacy. And now Stacy is following Jesus and she's making a difference with her life today. <clears throat> and, and it's because, uh, you know, it probably doesn't feel all that righteous to show up at somebody's house and you're waiting for a kid like 30 minutes and they're not ready and they get in their car and they're putting their feet all over your thing and they're messing stuff up and they don't talk right. They don't, they're cussing around your kids and they're doing things that they ought not to be doing. It doesn't feel all that righteous. But week in and week out, Somebody's life is absolutely changed and redeemed and restored. And I'll tell you, we put up with a lot of mess in the church because 
You don't kick your kids out because they're making a mess in your house. Right? Your kids, they get in your house and they make a mess. We got water on the floor. <laughs> water. And it's a good problem. It's a good problem to have. And so I've just got a dream. We're going to pick people up. We're going to love on kids. We're going to find people that nobody else wants. We're going to find the ones that are messy and dirty. The ones that, that nobody cares for. The ones that they would say, oh, if those people came to our church, it would be messy. What would, they, what would my friends think if they saw me hanging out with these people? That's what I want. I want a church full of that. Full of people that want to do that. Full of people that are, that are going to go out and, and reach people. I don't want a cool church. I don't want a cool church. You know what cool is? Cool means exclusive. Cool is the person that sits up on high and looks down and says, you ain't enough. You ain't got your hair the right way. You're wearing the wrong shoes. I remember the first time I met a kid wearing Nike shoes, and he's like, what are you wearing? I don't know. I got Velcro Kangas from Kmart. <laughs> and, and, and he was like, he tried to make me feel like next to nothing because I didn't have on Nike shoes. And, and I began to despise cool. I began to despise the better than mentality. And I said, if, if I can, I'm gonna make friends with everybody. I'm gonna love everybody. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best that you're valued not by your stuff, but by what Jesus paid for you. That's the kind of church that I see. I see a church that doesn't treat people based on their bank account. But based on what God paid for them. And so I want, I want to build a church. It's just a dream. What it would be like to be at a place where it didn't all the stuff, the external stuff, the color of your skin, the way that you vote, your gender, all of those things don't matter. What if you could come in and find a place where you would be loved and accepted and valued because of Jesus alone? And, and so, so, it, so there's a lot of messiness with that, right? There's a lot of messiness with all of that. And I want a church that's messy. I don't want a clean church. Because if there's no oxen in the stall, then there's no poop to clean. <laughs> right? That's what the Bible says. I didn't make that up. That's a verse. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible's an interesting book. Read it. <clears throat> and I have this, this other dream. We just celebrated this, this water baptism today. But I, I read the book of Acts, and on the first day of Pentecost, the day the Holy Spirit was poured out, the Bible says that 3,000 were added to number. 3,000 were baptized on that day. And I said, what if... What if I mean, they could do it in Jerusalem, a bunch of underachieving disciples. All they did was get baptized in the Holy Ghost. God did the rest, and then they baptized 3,000 in one day. So I said, someday we're going to baptize 3,000 people on one day. We gonna, we, so I figured, out, I figured out how we're going to do it. We're going to rent the carrier dome. Because if there's 3,000 people getting baptized, there'll probably be about 20,000 people there to see it. And we can't get that done over here. We're going to have to go to Syracuse to do it. And then we're going to get 100 tanks and put them all over the floor in the carrier dome. And then we're going to get a worship set, the killer, most amazing worship team that we ever assembled. We're going to throw them on the stage. And for 30 minutes, they're going to go hard. And, and we're going to have... 30 people baptized in each tank, a minute per tank, a minute per baptism, and we're going to get 3,000 people baptized on one day. Yeah. Come on. Pastor Will, you're so crazy. Here's how we know we're going to be able to do it. 
The Bible says it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That, that when, when the disciples showed up, he didn't, God didn't pick all the ones who had it all together. He didn't pick the ones who were likely. Like you go out at lunchtime and there's the line. I remember this as a kid. I, we would go out every day and we'd, have, we'd play dodgeball. Only we call it something else. And you stand on the wall and we, people would throw balls and, and you'd pick teams. And, and what would happen was, was you'd look and you'd judge based off of some real external things whether or not that person got picked for the team. How many been in the, the line to get picked? Right? You know, and so some of y'all are superstars at, at lunchtime. And some of y'all were the ones that got picked last. And the disciples were all the ones that got picked last. What happened was all, all the good people were already snatched up. They were already in the Bible school. They were already the ones that had gone to college to be pastors. They were the ones that all had it all together. They'd walk around with their nice clothes on. And they'd show up at places. And they'd get to sit in the seats of honor. And Jesus went out and he found all the people that were like the not picked ones, fishermen, tax collectors, all the ones that were overlooked, all the ones that when they went into a place, they didn't sit in the seat of honor. They knew better. I'm not going to sit there. That's where the important people sit. And so he went around, he picked out his team and he didn't... He, he didn't pick his team based on all the, the, the right conditions and on the right ways of doing things. He picked his team based off of the people that weren't good enough. And that might be what you feel like today. You know, as, you, as people get saved, they come into a relationship with Jesus and they start to struggle in their relationship. Disciples were like that. Disciples, they had a relationship with Jesus, but, you know, every one of them, they all... Like they all, every single one of the disciples rejected him. When Jesus was going to the cross, not one of the disciples stood with him. They all abandoned him. They all failed him. Every single one of his disciples, as he's walking around with the disciples, they're, he's like, hey, they're, they're like, Jesus, who's going to be the greatest in your kingdom? And Jesus is like, you guys got it all wrong. And Jesus is doing miracles, and they're, they're like, Lord, what's going on? They don't have any idea what's happening when they're with Jesus. They kept screwing up and doing it all the wrong ways. Peter, after, after the resurrection, goes back. He's like, I used to be a disciple. He done quit. Went back to fishing. I'm like, I'm out. And so Peter ends up when we find Jesus, he comes back and he finds Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. He's like, I'm going to reset this whole thing. But it, Jesus comes back and he tells his disciples something. All the screw ups, all the guys that had failed, all the ones that it, even though they had a relationship with him, they couldn't get it right. And that's kind of how we do it, right? We, we have a relationship with him, but, but it's hard to get it right. Like so many of us are stuck in addiction. So many of us have, have, have this depression that's on our life, and it's how do I get through this depression, and it's eating your lunch. There's a sin in your life that you just know. You're, I've never been able to have freedom over. I've never been able to conquer. I've never been able to win with that. And, and so what God, Jesus came back, and he says to him, I, I'm going to tell you guys, there's something I'm going to do for you. I want to give you power for life. And he says in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, he says, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when we baptize people in the water here, what we do is we, we say, hey, we, we're this church that, you know, baptize is actually this word, it means, it's baptizo, it means immersion, right? It's 
Like I, when we read in the Bible about following Jesus, we don't follow him halfway. We go all the way. We're, we go all the way kind of people, right? And so when we go in the water, we don't sprinkle. We immerse. We, we go all the way in because it's not, I'm, not, I'm not giving them a part of me. I'm giving them all of me. I'm surrendering all that I am to Jesus. And so, so when that's what death is, right? You don't half die. You all the way die. Or you ain't dead. Right? If you see somebody in a graveyard getting up out the grave, there's a problem. <laughs> they, that person ain't dead. Or it's Jesus. <clears throat> or you're getting left behind. So that's a Christian insider joke. You'll have to look that one up to f- figure that one out. Uh, so you go in the water, right? Every part of you is wet. Every part is immersed. Water's everywhere. Now that's, that's the imagery that Jesus wants us to understand. John baptized you with water. He got you all the way wet. He got you immersed. He got you dunked in there. Now, what God wants to do with your life, he wants to get you all the way immersed in the Holy Spirit. He wants the Holy Spirit dripping off of you. He wants the Holy Spirit in your life in a way that that when you go places, it's just flowing out of you. So where you go, drips and waters and stuff's happening, the Holy Spirit's getting off of you and getting onto somebody else. So when you hug somebody, you get them all wet. (laughs) And you can't help it. It just happens. You don't have to manufacture it. You don't have to work it up. So this is how, this is God's plan to take you and me, the unlikely. This is God's plan to take people who don't have all the goods don't have the Bible college training, don't have all the the ways to overcome and seven secrets to highly effective leadership. This is how God's plan is for you and me to live a victorious Christian life. This is God's plan for how as a church, when you look around the room, I don't see a thousand people. It's getting there, but it ain't there. And so what it is, is how are we going to baptize 3,000 people in one day? For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now it says in